In 2017, mother of two, Vicky Phelan, was given the devastating news that her cancer had returned, and this time it was terminal. Following the death of her good friend and fellow cervical check campaigner, Ruth Morrissey, we're sitting down with Vicky to hear about her own life and her hopes for the future. I am terminally ill and there is no cure for my cancer. Women of Ireland can no longer put their trust in the cervical check programme. Vicky Phelan, it's always a real pleasure to speak to you and thank you so much for coming to speak with us today. I know you're literally coming straight from St Vincent's Hospital where you've got your infusion of Pembro. So what is Pembro? What's happened today and what's it doing for you right now? Keeping me alive, basically. Um, so Pembro, or Pembrolizumab, a lot of people have a difficulty with the long version of it, is um, an immunotherapy drug. So most people, um, when they get diagnosed with cancer, the standard treatment that most people would get is chemotherapy. What I'm on is not chemotherapy, it's immunotherapy. So it's a new type of a drug that really has only come on stream really in the last, I would say, five years really. Um, and what the difference between this and chemotherapy is, chemotherapy literally doesn't target your cancer, it kind of floods your body um, and they're just hoping that it'll, you know, hit the tumour, but it also kills good cells as well as bad cells and that's why people are so sick and have so many side effects and lose their hair and all of that. Whereas with immunotherapy, the drug I'm on, I haven't lost my hair, I have a great quality of life. It actually uses your own immune system to attack your tumour. And the thing with um, cancer is, regardless of the fact that, say, there could be three women like me with cervical cancer, but we don't have the same type of tumour. You know, I think people, you know, are often don't understand why, you know, cancer is so difficult to treat because everybody's cancer is different. Um, because my cancer would be totally different to somebody else, even though we might have the same cancer. It's made up of different um, your genetic makeup. So, like, I have five tumours, but they could all have different genetic makeup, and that's the problem. It's trying to target all of those. So the, the beauty of immunotherapy is it's actually using your own immune system to target your cancer and that's why I mean I'm still alive you know two and a half years later. And you get cycles mm -hmm. of this every six weeks. Yes. Yeah. Are there side effects? Um, at the very beginning I did so I was on a three-week cycle at the very start and I actually moved over to a six-week cycle just before Christmas because we were going to New Zealand. I've had the only side effect I've had with the six-week cycle is I get sick maybe once every and it kind of happens nearly on the three-week mark. I get one day where literally I'm vomiting all day long and really bad headache and uh, kind of have to stay in bed because it's almost like a vertigo type of effect where if I move at all I'm vomiting. Um, but other than that, you know, in between my quality of life is excellent so I mean I can put up with one day of getting sick. And are there limitations? to the number of cycles of this immunotherapy that you can have? How they figure out whether or not this will work for you is they take a sample of your tumour and they test it. So they test it to see if you have markers that will um, respond to this type of drug. So you have to test above 55%. So if you don't have 55% of your tumours that will respond to this drug, they won't give it to you because it's so expensive. So I test it between 65 and 75%. But that means that there's about 25% of my tumours that won't respond to this drug, which is why I still have you know, a fairly sizable five centimetre tumour. So I'll get to a point where you know, I'm stable at the moment, but that will probably start creeping up. And then you're hoping that there's something else, you know, that will kind of... Uh, and I'm always looking for backups. You know, I have one at the moment um, if I have to. Um, and hopefully um, it's in London. You know, before that, I was looking at America. So you're always researching the next possible treatment. You don't look at it and say, when this Pembro lapses or stops working for me, that's it. Yeah, that's the way I operate anyway, you know. Um, I suppose the way I look at it is, you know, I, um, I saved myself really, you know, by researching this drug. Um, they weren't giving me any good news. Um, they basically told me to get my affairs in order. And if I had, I know, you know, definitely if I'd gone for the palliative chemotherapy at the time, you know, I would have been dead within 12 months. So the fact that I'm still here two and a half years later is testament to, you know, me kind of doing the research and pushing to get on this drug, even though there was no real evidence that this was going to work because the only trial I found that, uh, had been t carried out on women with cervical cancer with Pembro was uh, on seven women. You know, it's a very small trial, I mean, it's tiny. And of the seven, four had partial responses, two had full remission, but the rest then died. So, I mean, you're not looking at great numbers there, you know. Um, but at the same time, you know, I thought, well, you know, why shouldn't I have an opportunity to see if this works? 
and I kind of kept pushing until I, somebody got me on it, you know, really. Um, when, you know, I suppose the way I looked at it was I was backed into a corner and you'll fight, won't you? Especially when you have small children to see, um, you know, to, to, to get a chance to, to live, basically. More time. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And are your doctors able to predict <coughs> at all what is going to happen in your tumours or, you know, at what point Pembroke might not be as successful for you as it is now? Or do you just take each cycle as it comes? I know myself, you know, from talking to my doctors and what they've explained to me. So I have five tumours that form a mass around my aorta. It's near all of my organs. So like if it started growing, it would start encroaching on liver, lungs, kidneys, heart, you know, and, and the, like, so there's no possibility of surgery because of the fact that, you know, it's one of your biggest arteries in your body. Radiotherapy would damage organs as well. So that's why the only option for me is medical, really, you know, some kind of drug like what I'm on. Do you feel... Vicky, then, that this wonder drug, which mm. it is, I think, for you, but there's an indefinite amount of time then at this point. Is that that hopeful? Yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, I'd hope so. I would hope that I'd get another year or two on this, um, hopefully. Um, but you never know. I mean, uh, unfortunately, I haven't had any shrinkage, you know, in well over a year, probably about 15 months now at this stage. And that's a worry because you're waiting for it to start creeping back up. But like at the same time, I know my own body and because I was so sick before and I was so close to kind of really, you know, within weeks of dying, um, I kind of know what to look out for in my own, you know, the type of pain. And I mean, one of the big things for me was, I mean, my tumour was so big, it was pushing out my stomach. I looked like I was about eight months pregnant. So I know if that starts happening again, I'm like, you know, that's one indicator. The other th one is you get this kind of a tugging sensation because all of my tumours on my lymph nodes so it kind of pulls. It's very uncomfortable, so I couldn't sleep in a bed. I was sleeping in a recliner. Uh, so, you know, they're all, you know, I suppose the fact that I was, I know what to look out for. Um, so I'll know when it's time to start moving again, you know, but so far so good at the moment. I'm fine, you know. So in the time sort of outside, you know, looking for alternatives and coming up and down to mm. Dublin and for Pembro and the day that you say that you're sick, outside of that time, do you try and live sort of, I know you have cancer in your body, but without cancer in your head almost, you yeah, know, you yeah, have a no, cancer-free exactly life. Yeah, I do, honestly. It's very rare uh, these days, to be honest, because I'm so well that I even think about having cancer. And I do things without even, I mean, you know, we went to New Zealand at Christmas and I was paragliding and kayaking and, you know, I mean, <laughs> I didn't think I'd be doing things like that at this stage, you know, so it's great. I mean, you also I don't have no, I've looked at your Instagram, <laughs> I've been following your account, you have zero fear. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely. And, and you know, I never did. I was always kind of quite fearless, to be honest, anyway, but I think this has given me more of, uh, you know, sometimes I would have kind of stopped and, oh, maybe I won't do that. But now I don't. I just think, sure, what's the worst that can happen, you know? So I'll try anything at this stage. <laughs> Does it, or how do you feel about the fact that it was up to you to go off and do the research and find Pembro after you'd been told, you know, it's palliative chemotherapy and that's yeah. it? But that was left to you to do. Yeah, very angry. I mean, the, I'm not obviously anymore, but at the very start, you know, it took a long time for that anger to subside, I suppose, because I just thought of other people sitting in that waiting room, you know, on the same day as me, you know, probably getting the very same news. And a lot of people would just go home and take that and, you know, not do anything because they would, you know, accept the prognosis and assume that there was no other options, whereas I was always the type to question. Um, my mother would always tell you that. I was the child who always asked why, 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 you know, from a very <laughs> young age, you know. And then you were I was one of those two or three I was one of those, yeah, 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 painful children. <laughs> I wasn't going to use that yeah. word, but I do know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, I suppose that's why I got into, you know, working in education. You know, I always questioned everything. Um, and I will read up about things, you know, a lot and never think that I can't find something myself. You know, I've, I've really, you know, I, I've, I have very good research skills. I know that. And they really came to the fore, you know, when, when it came to the crunch then. I remember going home that day and I was absolutely, I wasn't expecting that. You know, you know, I thought she'd tell me 12 to 18 months. But when she said 6 to 12 months, Jesus Christ, you know, I, I really couldn't believe it. Um, you know, it was... You know, you read these books or you see things and that description of, you know, the legs went from under me. I mean, I never understood that description until it happened. You know, literally, my legs went to jelly. I could barely stand up, you know, just from the shock of hearing that. Because I felt so well. That was the thing at the time. So, you know, I suppose I remember that night kind of going home and, you know, feeling sorry for myself, as you would, obviously. Um, but I remember it took me a, two, a day or two to kind of think, 
it went from kind of feeling sorry for myself and kind of panicking to kind of going, well, hang on a minute. Maybe there is something, you know. And I got really angry and I thought, I'm going to start looking and see if there's anything else. Surely there must be something. And that was it. I was on the laptop. And I knew I had two weeks between that appointment and meeting the medical oncologist who was literally going to start me on palliative chemo. And I thought, right, I'm going to use the two weeks now and see if I can come up with something myself. And that's what I did. And I remember going in armed with the papers and your man was nearly, you know, he'd had a heart attack when he saw me coming. But like, that was up to me to but do. But you did all of that. And I did it all myself. And not everybody has. No your abilities. Not mm -hmm. everybody is probably as likely to not take no for an answer. Yeah. Not everybody is as formidable as you are, or mm -hmm. as you say, as academic that you are, that you're able to read those papers, find that trial, find that drug, get on the phone, make things happen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was ringing Mark Sharp and Dome, the company that make Pembrolizumab. I was making a nuisance to myself, trying to get contacts, you know, to get through to somebody who would give me access to it. I rang Vincent's, I was on to, I found out the name of three oncologists in Vincent's who were using this drug with patients, not necessarily cervical cancer patients, but that still didn't put me off. I just thought, well, they're using it. Surely they'll take somebody. And I, I kind of thought, look, I'll sign whatever waivers you want. If I die, I die, but I really don't have options. You know, I'll sign whatever paperwork you want, because I know that's the way these things operate. It's all insurance. Um, and I said I'm willing to take, the, to take the risk and that's kind of how I got it in the end, you know. I rang TDs, I was on to Simon Harris even at that stage, ever before he knew who I was. You know, so I made a nuisance of myself and made sure I got it, you know, because... And wasn't that worthwhile? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, here today. I was just open for maybe 12 months, you know, but two and a half years later. And a quality of life that I haven't spent more than one week in hospital in that two and a half years, you know. Which is wonderful. Yeah. How far ahead then do you look, Vicky? Me, I don't ever look too far ahead, to be honest. You can't because I've seen so many women die over the last two and a half years that, you know, you know that you can't plan that far ahead. So for me, I kind of maybe go six weeks, eight weeks. I don't ever really plan much beyond that because if you build yourself up too much and then you, something doesn't happen, it's very hard to come back from that in this situation, you know, very hard because it's already difficult enough kind of, you know, knowing that you're facing into this. So last year, for example, my son made his communion and that was my goal, you know, to get through the communion. So you kind of just give yourself little goals all the way along, you know. And you just keep achieving mm. them. You said you've watched a lot of good people day, a lot of friends mm. day, and obviously in only recent weeks, we lost your fellow campaigner, but your friend yeah. more than anything, yeah. Ruth Morrissey. You wrote a really, really powerful piece, Vicky, in the Sunday Independent. Mm. When did you write that? I started writing it, I think, uh, that night, actually, when Ruth died. Um, the day she died, I got a phone call from my solicitor, Keno Carroll, who was also Ruth's solicitor, to tell me. Now, I had been waiting for the news, to be honest, from about March, between March and July when Ruth died, she had been in and out of the hospice more than she was at home, you know. Um, things were getting worse, you know. She had new tumours in her spine. She was confined to a wheelchair. I mean, people don't see that side of this cancer and that's, you know, one of the things, you know, it's just... A horrible end. A horrible end, it really is, so... But, you know, of all the women I've met, um, <laughs> who've had cervical cancer, Ruth really, unfortunately, you know, had an awful lot of complications. Um, from the very first day I met her, she was on crutches, you know, and I felt so guilty a lot of the time because I'm so well, you know, and that's hard, you know, uh, as well. But I remember that day when I got the news, obviously I was very upset. Thank God the kids weren't there. They were actually gone off camping, you know. I didn't even get dressed, to be honest. I just stayed in my pyjamas and I didn't do anything for the day. I just cried, really, you know. It really hit you. Hard. Oh, very hard, yeah, because we were such good friends and um, <clears throat> she was so young, you know, and she was really looking forward to her daughter making her communion. That was her goal, you know. They'd gone off shopping for the dress and if COVID hadn't happened, she would have made the communion in April, but, you know, it didn't. So nothing kind of went her way, you know, it's very hard. But then the sadness kind of turned to anger when um, I read her husband's statement because you could feel the anger in his statement about the way she was treated. And, that, and I kind of, I, I thought, I couldn't kind of on the day of her death, I, I thought I, I can't come out and say these things because, you know, out of respect for her, obviously. Um, but I just wrote it down myself, the anger. I just put it down on the page. I keep a journal. I've always kept a journal, especially when things are bad. So I just wrote down, you know, exactly how I felt, just dumped it on the page. And that kind of formed the basis of the article. And it was about two days later, I decided 
I had to make this public, I had to do something um, because, you know, we had all these apologies coming out, um, hollow, false apologies again. You know, it's not the first time we've seen them and I, I, I just got angry and anger and I thought I have to, you know, make people sit up and listen. And that's, I just literally <laughs> wrote the whole lot. Um, how you really felt. How I felt, yeah. yeah. And I know it was hard and I remember saying to my parents um, about, uh, you know, I said, look, it's quite hard <laughs> for them, you know, for, for, for my family to read what I wrote is hard. Um, because we don't really talk about, it's not that we don't talk about me dying, but you know, I probably talk about it more than they do, but they don't want to talk about it, you know. But for me, I have to, because I'm kind of, I suppose, trying to prepare them for it as well. Um, because it is going to happen, you know, unless a miracle happens really, you know. Um, five years, I would say, at the most, you know, I would say three, probably. Um, just with everything I know about this disease. Um, and it's very hard for my parents and my family and my kids uh, to, hear me talking about it but I suppose that's my way of dealing with it because I think it's worse if you for me I suppose waiting until the end you know there's no point in doing that then and then everybody's up in arms but um, yeah my parents were quite upset obviously I wanted mum and dad to read it before it was published but they don't read anything on the laptop so <laughs> um, they waited until the Sunday but yeah so we're taking a bat mm. yeah were you able to go to Ritz funeral Yes, I was. So we did a guard of honour at Ruth's funeral and then I met with the family afterwards. Mm. And what was going through your head? My, it, it kind of a bit like, I felt the same kind of thing as I had at Emma. I went to Emma Vic Fahona's funeral as well and it's kind of like watching for me. It's like watching my own funeral kind of happening, you know, and this is going to be mine in a few years. And it's hard, it's hard to stand there and watch that, you know, because you know the way it's going to end. It took me a couple of weeks now to just come around from roots, to be honest. And it's very hard. It, death is hard anyway on everybody, isn't it? And, you know, it's hard to believe that I'll never see her again, you know. And because of COVID, I hadn't seen her since February, whereas we would have met really regularly up to that point, you know. And what's also, I would imagine, for you, because I know how much your family mean to you and your kids mean to you, is to see Ruth's family, to yeah. see her husband, mm. to see her daughter, to yeah. look at Libby and look at Paul there that day and to see the devastation that's left behind. Yeah, yeah, that's it, yeah. And, you know, Ruth and Paul and Libby, they were a real little unit. They were one of those families that did everything together, you know, and that was all that was important to Ruth was her family, you know, and doing stuff with her, her husband and, and her daughter. Um, and like Ruth couldn't have any more kids because of cancer, you know, she would have loved to have had them, but, you know, unfortunately, you know, she could only have the one, and that's another thing that was kind of taken from her as well, you know, at a very young age. You said you were obviously devastated and then so angry, and I want mm. to read you um, what you wrote. I am here to tell you now, while I still can, that I don't want your apologies. I don't want your tributes. I don't want your aid to camp at my funeral. I don't want your accolades or your broken promises. I want action, I want change, and I want accountability. Do you feel confident, Vicky, at this point in your life that you're going to see that? No, not in my lifetime, no. And it's a terrible thing to have to say, but no. I think we'll get some of it. Um, uh, you know, some of the things I've asked for are doable. They're kind of already half done, like the patient safety bill that will bring in mandatory open disclosure. That was already brought before the last government. It just has to be put into drafted into law um, and you know I will be pushing for that to happen as soon as they come back in September. And the Tanisha has said, Leo Vradkin yeah. has said, that will be coming in from the Dáil in the next Dáil session. So does that reassure you? Well, not really because he only said that because of my article and the pressure that is being put on the government. Do you know what I mean? There was no talk of it until I came out with my big angry piece, do you know what I mean? And Ruth having died the previous week. Um, but there are some things like the National uh, Cervical Screening uh, Laboratory, so to bring screening home, which is a big one. Um, and in fairness, the HSE have come out and committed to um, having that up and running by 2022. Now, like everything, look at the Children's Hospital. You know, we'll see whether that will actually happen. But I do think that it will happen, but it may take a bit longer. Um, but what, one of the positives, I suppose, um, that has come out of, you know, with the cervical check scandal is that, you know, there's been a huge drive to kind of revamp the national screening service and the cervical check um, program. So I spoke actually only a couple of days ago to the new CEO of the um, national screening service and she's worked in the NHS in Scotland for the last, you know, 15 or 20 years. 
and I really like her. I think she's going to be very good. Um, you know, which already kind of uh, told me what she thinks is wrong, what needs to be fixed. So, and she's chairing this um, committee that's overseeing the development for the new cervical screening laboratory. So I think there's a lot of positives, but I don't know if I'll see them all. I mean, it would be great if I do see them all before I go, but at the same time, if I knew that they were nearly there, I'd be happy. Um, but, you know, my kind of motivation for this is, you know, I have a 14-year-old daughter um, who has had her HPV vaccine and hopefully will not develop cervical cancer, but unfortunately it is hereditary. So, I mean, I have a huge, um, you know, motivator mm -hmm. to get this right. Um, and, you know, obviously for the women of Ireland, but it's my daughter um, that motivates me to get this done. <music>
uh, would have been notified, usually, kind of by the end of May, um, and like there's a statute of limitations. So the statute of limitations is up since the end of May for a number of the women in that group. And that's one of the reasons we've had a huge worry about the way the tribunal has been delayed and delayed and delayed. And we've been looking for them to kind of make a commitment that, you know, that they're not going to pull a fast one and that the statute of limitations will run out for women because of a delay with establishing the tribunal. The tribunal will help women to get through these cases faster. Um, but w one of the other things that we're trying to push for, and Michal Martin did promise that in the Doyle when he was making his apology to Ruth's family, um, that the tribunal is actually not any less adversarial than a high court case. It's just behind closed doors. And there are advantages and disadvantages to that. I mean, the media have been fantastic in highlighting um, what has been going on in the court cases. If that they're not allowed into these cases, you know, the behaviour of the labs or the HSC may not be, uh, you know, great. And I know I've had experience of it. Um, it can be very uh, aggressive and the questioning can be very aggressive and very personal and it's very hard. Whereas if the media are there, they tend to behave themselves a bit better. So we're looking for a less adversarial um, tribunal. So we're looking for it to be amended to, especially now that the HSE has been found to be liable, the fact that there's not going to have to be labs there that should be possible. Well, and we're doing this not just for you know the, 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 the 221 women and their families, we're doing this for the women of Ireland, you know, and, and to make... And you do feel that sense of responsibility, do, yeah, don't absolutely. you? I get that from you. I do. I do because women contact me all the time from around the country with horrible stories, um, you know, and uh, women, you know, we don't have a great track record in this country with the way we treat women and, it, you know, it hasn't really improved, to be honest, you know. Do you ever worry, Vicky, because you've put so much work into the cervical check screening programme at this mm. point and getting changes, that you won't be here to see it through and that nobody will be there to lift the mantle? I do worry that I won't be here, you know, and that's a huge thing uh, um, for me because I'd love to kind of have it sorted before I go, you know, there's that kind of a thing. You know, I feel like I can't go until it is. Maybe that's what's keeping me alive. You know, I do wonder often um, is that it's the drive to get these things done that's keeping me alive as well because I want to see it happen. Um, and but I do think women in general in this country need to kind of stand up as well for themselves and um, demand more, you know, demand more and not, not accept what, uh, you know, if you're not happy with, you know, simple things like if you're not happy with your doctor, move. You know, there are simple things that people can do. If you're not happy with your prognosis, ask questions, Absolutely. push, yeah, yeah. etc. You spend so much of your life, um, Vicky, you know, speaking to the press and giving interviews and trying to push this agenda because you are so determined, as you say, to see it through to the end. I wonder then, how does that impact on your family life and on your kids? Mm. I know you've always said you're honest with your children. You're mm. an honest person, but you're always, or you're also a mum first and foremost, who tries to protect their kids. Yeah, it's been difficult kind of trying to find a balance. Actually, one thing I found with COVID since, you know, we've been in kind of in lockdown, it's actually made me slow down. I think I realised I was doing way too much. I mean, when I look at what I was supposed to do in March, I think, Jesus Christ, thank God COVID came along in some respects because, you know, I just keep saying, oh yeah, I'll do this, I'll do that. And, you know, whenever I'm in Dublin, like today, you know, go for treatment and I fit in an interview or, you know, I mean, anyone else would be going home, going to bed. <laughs> But that's just the way I am, I suppose. I kind of, you know, I, I feel like, at least when I'm in Dublin, you know, I'm not away from my kids for an extra day. So that's why I try and fit it in on days where I have treatment. Uh, uh, you know, I might have two or three different things so that at least when I go home, I'm with my kids. And that's my, the way I kind of do it. Most of the time, I, I would fit in interviews and things around their school time. You know, so when they're gone to school, I'll do loads of stuff. But once they're at home, then I try not to take any calls. Or I'll do it at night time, then get back on the laptop and go on Twitter or whatever when they're in bed. Because I see on your Instagram account, there's mm. loads of lovely pictures of lovely family time and really special experiences with their kid, your kids. Mm. And you say always fill in their memory bank. That's, That's what you're doing. Yeah, it's really important. I think, you know, one of the things, you know, there are good things that have come out of having a terminal illness. They make you re it makes you realise what's really important. You know, I mean, I was no different than anybody else worried about stupid stuff like, uh, you know, being overweight and kind of not wanting to go somewhere because, you know, I don't look right or I don't have the right clothes. I couldn't care less anymore. I'm gone past that. You know, I just want to spend my time with my kids while I can because unfortunately I see that, you know, it w there, there will be an end to it. And, you know, I won't be able to do these things, so, you know, I try and pack it all in as much as I can. Now, at the same time, 
I have to be realistic and, you know, I can't always be on the go. And sometimes we'll just sit down and watch a movie or, you know, go for a walk or something. But when they're off, I try and do kind of different things. And I, I, obviously I'll ask them what they want to do and, and fit it around them. So you're actively trying to fill, yeah. fill your time so that they have lots of things yeah. that they can, when they think of you, they remember a hundred countless wonderful days. Yeah. Is that the idea? That's the idea, yeah, because I think that's what they'll remember. They'll remember what I did with them. You know, and do you talk to them about where your treatment is at? Yep. And where your cancer is at? Mm. Is that an ongoing conversation? It is. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I suppose I know from my own daughter. You know, she's been. You know, from when she was born. You know, we've had a lot of issues with her. She's huge medical condition, and then she was very badly burned when she was seven. So we've been in and out of hospital with her quite a lot um, over the years, and I know from. That those experiences with her, that it's important to kind of talk to her about, um, you know, what's going to happen and about her treatment. And then when I got cancer, it was the same thing. Obviously, it's age appropriate. Like when I was diagnosed first, my son was only three. So, you know, at the time, you're just kind of saying, Mammy has a sore belly, whereas now he's nine. You know, once he got older and understood, well, then I explained what cancer was. And uh, <laughs> I remember somebody said to me, Jesus, how did you think of that? I remember he was massive into Star Wars at the time, so I started drawing. Now, I can't draw, but I tried my best. Um, you know, the Death Star and, you know, the lightsabers. And I was saying, well, it's like, you know, as if, you know, imagine the Death Star is my tumour and lightsabers kind of disintegrate thing, you know, like, you know, when Luke Skywalker chop someone's head off they're gone I said that's what the treatment does do you know so he understood that he got that, he got that you know and as we go along you know the week I was in hospital I was upfront about it um, you know he was upset that I was gone because normally I might be gone for a night or two that's the only thing I do notice that he's very when I'm going anywhere I have to tell him you know where I'm going when I'm going to be back and if I'm not back then he starts getting a bit anxious and, I, and that's understandable you know what I mean because you know at the back of his head he knows that you know I'm sick and the last time you know I was in hospital I was in hospital for a week um, but you know as long as he knows and you keep him kind of up to date he's okay you know and like when I'm well they don't worry about me it's only when maybe they see me lying down if I'm tired or like one you know I get sick every two or three weeks and I'm in the bed for a whole day practically and that he does get worried and he'll be coming up rubbing my head and do you want to come tea ma'am or you know he's very good at minding me but at the same time um for me, it's important that I, I, I explain to my kids what's going on because I think what's worse is what they imagine in their heads, I feel, with kids. And, you know, some people think I probably tell them too much, but it works for me and my kids, you know. What is your own situation now at home? Because you, you spoke very honestly about your marriage mm. and the fact that you were no longer... Um, married to your husband mm. um, and that you had separated but he was living in the house because you were so conscious I suppose of the kids and creating any upsets for them or any further upset is that still the case yeah so before my cancer came back uh, my cancer came back at the end of November 2017 um, and we in May 2017 we had made the decision to separate you know before my cancer came back now we hadn't at that stage uh, Jim wasn't working, he was still in college and we couldn't afford to, to separate and, you know, him to move out like a lot of mm -hmm. couples, you know, we weren't in a position that, you know, we could have two houses. Um, so we didn't really know how it was going to pan out, but we had made the decision to separate. Then my cancer came back and kind of put it, that spanner in the works. And in November, then when my cancer came back, I kind of said, we sat down and I said to Jim, I said, look, you know, I can't, for the kids, I said, I really can't do this to them. You know, my cancer is back. At that stage, I didn't know how long I was going to get until, you know, January. Um, but I knew it wasn't good. I knew it wasn't going to be good. And I said, I can't have a situation where, you know, I could be dead in 12 months and us separating. I said, it's just too much for the kids. So I said, you know, if we can just stay together for the sake of the kids. And, you know, obviously we're kind of not a couple, but, you know, as far as possible, try and co-parent and be a family and that's worked you know for us for the last two years nearly three years at this age. Wow and you still yeah. do that? Yeah we still do it yeah yeah it works for us for the moment anyway. I wonder given everything you're going through do you miss having that sort of companion though the kind of intimate companion that person that you go home to at the end of the day and you don't have to put a brave face on anymore yeah. and you just utterly be yourself and tell them how you're really feeling? No, do you know, I, I don't, to be honest, because I have great friends and my parents, like, you know, my parents are great, great support. I'd be lost without them. But, you know, for me, I suppose, 
I just think with this type of cancer in particular, um, it's very hard on relationships. Um, you know, I've read research on this, up to 50% of marriages break down after cervical cancer diagnosis. And there are lots of reasons for that, obviously with where your cancer is. It's very hard to get your head around the fact that you've got a tumor in your vagina, you, you know what I mean? And when you do have treatment and you're poked and prodded to within an inch of your life and you know, really your vagina is only medical, you know what I mean? There, you can, it's very hard to go back to seeing yourself as a sexual being mm -hmm. after that. So I found that very difficult. And I suppose because our marriage was already kind of breaking down, you know, there was no coming back from it. Do you know what I mean? At that stage, whereas a lot of other women I've met try, you know, to kind of get back to some type of intimacy. And if they had a good, strong marriage beforehand, you know, they might survive it. But a lot of them don't. You know, it's very hard. Do you very think hard. Your original cancer diagnosis contributed to your marriage ultimately not working. Yeah, yeah. Now we'd had um, Amelia had had her accident the year before my cancer. And that really was one of the big things that, um, you know, kind of contributed to, to mm. you know, the breakdown of our marriage. Just, and a lot of people say that when a child has had a traumatic incident that it either makes, or, you know, it's very hard mm. because, now thankfully both of us were there at the time because um, I've spoken to other families who would have been in a similar situation. So there was no blame game. There was no, you know, kind of him wondering, well, you know, mm. did you do the right, do you know, we were both there and we did exactly what we should have done, you know, but it was very hard for us. We, we both deal with things very differently. I'm, I'm a talker, I have to talk, you know, and he's not. And, you know, it was very, very difficult to get through it because it was so traumatic for us, you know, um, burn injuries. Like of all the things that has happened to me, that is that the, the worst. worst. I, your child. I would go through anything again. I would not go through that. No way. No. Horrible. Really horrible. You know, and she spent six weeks in hospital. Dressing changes were horrendous. They used to have to give her morphine, you know, before it, and oh, it was horrendous. Yeah. It left its mark. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. For years, you know. I mean, I can just really talk about it now, but it's about the only thing that makes me, you know, <coughs> get upset. I can talk about most other things, but not that. You Why know. is that? Do you think? It's, it's so traumatic, you know, and it's your own child. Mm -hmm. I suppose I'm, I'm such a control freak. It's easier when it's happening to me, but when it happens to your child, it's very hard because you can't take that pain away. That's it, and that I felt totally helpless and powerless when it happened to her because I couldn't take her pain away, you know. Which is what a mother always wants to yeah, do. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So I suppose when I got diagnosed with cancer then, that was my big priority was to try and shield the kids from it, but not pretend it wasn't happening, you know, but to be there for them as much as I could, you know, because I couldn't do that for Amelia, you know, at the time. So that was kind of my motivator really to kind of make sure that they were okay. Because I would imagine more than anything else, uh, as a mother, it's the idea of leaving your kids. That's yeah. the hardest part. Oh, that's the hardest part for me. Yeah, absolutely. That'll be the worst of everything, you know, really well. Yeah. But I suppose <coughs> my big thing is, you know, Mila's going into junior cert year now. So, you know, I'm kind of thinking ahead. If I could get her through junior cert, there will be 10 in February, double digits. Do you know, I kind of think I'll have a good, you know, I suppose when Dara, when I was diagnosed first, Dara was three. So, do you know, I'm doing well that I'm still here. And he's, he'll be 10 in February, so. And you feel you've left them with a good yeah, grounding. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And they'll, have, yeah. they'll, you're still here, obviously, Vicky, very much here, but they'll always, they'll know exactly who you are and they'll yeah. remember, as you say, everything that you've done. Yeah, and absolutely. You know. I think when kids are older, they have better memories. And that's why I do so much with them and spend so much time with them because I want them to have those memories, you know, when I'm not here. So. But that's the tough part, isn't it? Yeah, that is the tough part. And then, you know, I don't kind of think too far ahead because we went to London last October, myself and Amelia, to see a concert in Camden. And I remember uh, going, walking through Camden, it was Amelia's first time in, in, in Camden and she loved it, you know, just kind of so cosmopolitan, so different. Um, and she was talking about going to college, you know, and she said, oh God, wouldn't it be great if I came to London to go to college? And we were talking about that. And I remember that night going to bed and I got upset because I thought, God, I'm not going to be here. Do you know, I have to put myself back from those because I can't go too far ahead, you know. That's just, that's just really difficult for you, obviously. That's when I lose it, you know. <laughs> because you, you want to be here for everything, don't yeah. you? Yeah. That's why you bring kids. Nobody wants to miss those. Mm -mm. So, you know, you don't think too far ahead, mm. you can't. Because when you start thinking too far ahead, then you know, you're, you know, well, what if I'm not there for that, you know? And but what, that's what drives me on, you know, at the same time. What do you do in those moments to say, do, do you allow yourself I, I, to feel oh, it? I do. You have to. Yeah. You have to. Yeah. 
Uh, but then I kind of pull myself out of it, you know. It takes a while sometimes, but usually I'm fine. Kids don't like to see their mommy cry, do they? No. Mommies have to put on brave No, faces. but you know what? I think it's good for them to see it too, you know, and That's I do fun. plenty of it <laughs> with my kids. <clears throat> in fairness, Amelia's um, nearly 15 now, and, you know, she's very tuned into yeah. what's going on, yeah, and she's very good. At, because she's been through so much herself, she's much more grown up than a kind of a, a teenager, you know, of her age because of what she's been through herself, you know, so she'd be very good and she'd know, she'd know by me whether something's bothering me or not, you know. She'd become a pal. Yeah, 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 actually the lockdown has been great for that. We've spent a lot of time together. Um, now we kill each other as well. <laughs> because <laughs> she's very like her normal. mother, she's, she's exactly like me. She's stubborn, she's, you know, feisty, and, which is good, which is good. It'll stand I know her. she'll be fine, exactly, that's it, that's it. Would you ever like to meet anybody else? Me? Uh, no, I have no, no, absolutely not. I'm happy. I'm absolutely, I, I, I'm too set in my ways now, Kira. at this stage. I think um, I'm happy now just to spend whatever time I have with my children and my friends and my family um, without um, kind of adding somebody else into the mix. There's just one other thing that I wanted yeah. to ask you about, Vicky, because <coughs> when you wrote that piece, you said that all the changes in cervical check that you have called for time and time again, let that be Ruth Morrissey's legacy. Mm -hmm. But let my legacy be my right to die on my own terms. Yes. What did you mean by that? I remember when I wrote that, um, you know, at the end I kind of thought, oh, maybe that's kind of taken away from, you know, the focus of, of the piece. Mm. And I sent it to Alan, the editor, and I asked his advice and I said, do you think maybe leave that out and just, you know, focus on, kind of the cervical check issues and whatever. And the reason I kind of put that in there was because I'd actually had a phone call from Gene O'Kenny, the TD, who's bringing this bill forward again. It was brought forward in 2015, and then it didn't go through, like a lot of things. Um, and um, he had asked me would I help him support it, because he knew I'd seen pieces I'd done before mm. supporting um, you know, euthanasia and, and people's right to die um, with dignity. And I said, absolutely. I said, I have a huge obviously vested interest in this and I think you know people should have a choice because unfortunately in my position you know I wouldn't be able to get on a plane now and go to you know Switzerland or um, Oregon because you know I wouldn't get there because I'm known at this stage you know mm. and, and as well as that I, I wouldn't like to do that because you know I want to die at home in my own country I don't want to have to go somewhere else and have my poor family travel over and then travel back with a cough do you know what I mean mm. So you don't um, have that trauma for that. I don't, no. Yeah. And I just thought that was in my head, I suppose, and that's why I put that in. But I did ask Alan about putting it in, and he said, no. He said, that's. I th he said, I think you know, it's a good. Um, a, he said, if that's how we feel, and he said, that's what you'd like your legacy to be. He said, it's a good end, you know, to to the piece. So I was glad I put it in because it'll start, you know, conversation around this again. I think. And look, I know it's not for everybody, but I suppose the way I look at it is. Um, people should have the choice. I mean, I know from having, uh, you know, witnessed and heard um, from other um, people who have gone before me with this disease, it's not a nice way to go. And I, you know, would rather not have my children. I have young children. That's the thing. It's different if you're in your 80s and you've lived your life and, you know, uh, but if you're, you know, young uh, and you have children watching you die, um, and I've seen people die and it's not a nice thing to witness. I don't want my children's memories um, to be of me, you know, dying and, you know, there's a particular sound, I'm sure if you've, I don't know if you've seen somebody, but it's not nice, you know, and, you know, there's a lot of pain involved with this cancer um, at the end and, you know, I don't see why I should have to suffer or my children should have to suffer. So it's not about the pain that you'll be feeling, mm. it's not the physical side effects that you're worried about. It's the emotional impact that yeah. it'll have on your kids. Yeah. That's why you want it. Absolutely. Yeah. And then it's not a nice way to go. No, no. We no. don't do it to animals. And this is what really bugs me, you know. Um, you know, we put animals down gently. Uh, why should we not be able to do it with, with, um, with people, if, especially when there's an awful lot of pain involved, you know. And do you think there should be limitations yes. to this? Yes, <clears throat> absolutely. And there is. I mean, the bill that has been brought in, I've read it and I've gone through it. It has to be... Uh, witnessed by two different medical practitioners. They can't be related to you. It has to be very independent. 
and it's only in limited circumstances, so where there's a terminal illness, where there's no coming back. And I do understand that there are people who would be worried that, would, you know, there would be families who might abuse it, or there's an elder relative and, you know, they want to kind of, you know, finish it off, um, you know, rather than hanging around, you know, whatever the reasons are. But I think, as, you know, there's plenty scope within the bill for that to be very well marshaled, you know. And yet you will hear, and I've read about it already, these arguments that it's a slippery mm. slope, is a phrase that you always hear, that it starts by allowing people with a terminal illness, you know, to decide when they want to die in certain circumstances, but then it becomes somebody who has a chronic illness or somebody who's suffering a psychological, perhaps, mm. not physical. Yeah. And that it, it broadens and broadens and broadens once it gets a foothold here. Mm -hmm. Would that worry you? Um, there's always a worry, I suppose, with anything that, 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 you know, if it gets in, that it will end up getting extended. But I suppose my point is, you know, try and live in my shoes and have, you know, what I have to face, you know, going around in your head every day, especially when somebody else mm. dies and you know that, you know, it's not going to be an easy end, you know. It's 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 not fair, you know. I mean, if I had my choice, I'd go to Switzerland or wherever. But I I can't do that, you know. And I wouldn't do that to any of my family members, you know, if they were to be prosecuted when they came home. So it's not an option, you know. But this is something that you're going to start fighting for now, right? Yes. You? Yeah. That's my next fight. Beyond all of that, mm. what's your dream now, Vicky? Whoa, God, I wasn't expecting that question. Um, so we're at the end of August now. My big thing, I suppose, is to get my son to 10 and hopefully get my daughter through her junior search because I think that's a big thing for mothers to be around for. Um, beyond that, just to be as well as I am, really. I mean, I don't have any big dreams or aspirations, just to be well. Um, to do what I'm doing and, you know, hopefully see some of these things through um, before I go, really, other than that, you know, spend time with my family and friends. I really don't have any big kind of bucket list things, you know. Quality time with Quality, the kids. yeah. That sounds it. good to me. Yeah. Vicky Phelan, thank you, as always. Thanks, Kira. If you have been affected by any of the issues raised in this programme, please visit our support page, virginmediatelevision.ie forward slash helplines. There you will find a link to the 221 Plus Patient Support Group who are there to provide information, advice and support to the women and families directly affected by failures in the cervical check screening programme.